Well, I want to tell you about my, uh, my son, uh, my grandson, another grandson. He had uh, surgery this week, and he, he had uh, surgery on his elbow. He had, a, he had a, a break in his elbow, and he was playing ball. In fact, he's a quarterback, and he was playing ball with it. He played a ball game the week before, played two ball games the week before uh, he had the surgery. And the Atlanta Braves team physician did the surgery, and we could have never seen him except my, one of my sons, who is uh, assistant athletic director in charge of sports medicine at Baylor, called him. And he agreed to see him, and he said it, if he left it alone, it would take over three years to heal. And so he said that would really end your career. And, he, and so after he actually got in and did the surgery, he said it was actually worse than he thought it was. But he's fine now, and he's got a six-month rehab, and hopefully he'll be able to be released in the spring in time to play some baseball. He's a pitcher and infielder. So, um, so we'll see. And uh, we're glad to get that taken care of. And I'm glad to see all of y'all with us today. And I uh, hope some more will join. But right now, we're just going gonna, gonna to jump in pretty soon. Had uh, Yashua, I wish you could have heard him. Yashua is uh, quite a gifted musician. He's, I just can't believe how far he's come. And uh, good or bad, he sounds a lot like me, good or bad. And I think, I hope it's good. But uh, anyway, he's holding his fingers up. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring them around so that you, well, I don't know if I can do that or not. Anyway, uh, trust me, they're with us, and they watch it online too, but uh, they're here. So uh, I'm so glad that, that you're here and they're here, and it's a great day. And we're going to have a, a kind of a birthday celebration this afternoon for Johnny, my wife. Her birthday is the 24th of this month, and uh, we have another grandson whose is the 24th of this month, and Hank's is the, what day is yours? 31st, yeah, because I had, on his birthday, I had surgery five years ago, and before that, right after that, I had back surgery. Every time I have a surgery, he has a birthday, and I'm, we're hoping to, I want the birthdays to continue, but the surgeries, I'd like to back off a little bit. Anyway, so uh, I want us to pray, and then we're going to start, and uh, I want to tell you, I never take it for granted, those of you that are with us live, and those of you that watch later on, I, I don't take it for granted about you guys. And I was just praying this morning, and we're going to be back in Romans 8 again. But um, sometimes I think, Lord, I just don't have anything. I don't have anything fresh. And I can just sense a smile on the Lord's face. And I was praying about it this morning, and just, you know, I knew where I was going to be. But, you know, sometimes you just, is, for lack of a better word, you just don't feel it. And uh, so the Lord said, just tell them what I tell you. Just, just tell them what you know. Tell them what you know. And somebody contacted me last week, one of the ones that was, I, I don't remember really who it was or what the situation was, but somebody was really grateful for the, for the time that we do this together. And they said, you know, they've been sharing some of these things <clears throat> with people and they get mad. And, uh, and that is the case. It's, a, it's, it's amazing when you tell somebody about the unconditional love of God that they would get mad, but they do. So anyway, uh, so what I told this lady, and it was a lady, I said, you know, just tell them what you know and just, and just leave the results up to God. And it's a hard thing to do to fight against love. So just love folks where they are. And sometimes I have a hard time with that. I'm just going to be honest. Sometimes I do. And we don't love people based on how they act because if that's the case, we wouldn't love very many folks. And... Wouldn't be too many folks loving us either. So I'm going to pray, and then we're going to start. Father, I just lift up this time before you today, and we thank you that, that, that you're the one, that your spirit is the one who reveals the truth of our identity in you to us, and then reveals how much you love us. And thank you for your scriptures that show us, in addition to the spirit, that, uh, that all that the spirit's been telling us in our heart is true, and we can believe it. I ask you right now to speak to folks all over the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, folks, uh, I just wrote a couple things, and I'm going to share them before we start. I was just in, in my own Bible study this morning, my own quiet time, or for lack of a better word, just time alone. And uh, I wrote down some verses that the Lord shared with me, and then I'm going to read something at the end. I think it's going to fit for what we're going to look at today. 
Jeremiah 31, 3, I'm going to read Jeremiah 31, 3, Exodus 15, 13, and then Hebrews 13, 8. You recognize Hebrews 13, 8. We have the idea that the God of the Old Testament was pretty rough. And if you didn't do right, he'd squash you. And then we see that the God of the Old Testament is the same God of the New Testament. Nothing changed. In fact, let me read Hebrews 13, 8 first. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. The Jesus of eternity is the same Jesus that loves us today. The Jesus of the past is the same Jesus that loves us today. And there are things that we didn't understand. But let me read you some things some of his prophets shared. In Jeremiah 31, 3, it says, The Lord appeared to us in the past, saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with loving kindness. The same way that God loves us today is the same way that, that He loved those in the Old Testament. Now, there are things that we don't understand. You know, the writers that were writing things, sometimes they didn't understand. And they wrote what appeared to them. But I can tell you, the love of God is consistent. It never changes. In Exodus 15, 13, which was written by Moses, it says, In your unfailing love, you will lead the people you have redeemed. Some people say, yeah, he'll lead, he'll lead those who, have, who he's redeemed. And, but then you understand, who is it that he's redeemed? Who is it that he's bought with the price? Well, the Bible says that when one died, all died on the cross. And so when Christ died, we died. When Christ was buried, we were buried. When Christ was raised, we were raised to walk in newness of life. All this took place before we knew anything, before we believed anything, before we did anything. It was finished. You were justified by His blood, not by your actions. You were reconciled while you were an enemy and you were saved by His life. While you were dead, He made you alive. You were chosen in Him before the foundation of the world. And last week we talked about this. You were adopted. It says, in love, in love, I like the way He says that, He predestined you to be adopted as sons. Now that's pretty cool. Well, in when it says, you ha He has redeemed, in your strength you will guide them to your holy dwelling. It's the Spirit of God that, do, that guides us into our true identity in Him. And then I'm going to finish up with the same verse that I started with. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. And then as a result of these things, I just some things I was reading. Some of it I copied. Some of it's mine. But, but I'll just share it. God says to us, release our worries into His care. Trust to me everything that concerns you. Well, this is for all of us. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what you've been through. I don't know what you're about to go through. And you probably don't either. But release our worries. I'm talking for me now. Into His care. And entrust to me everything that concerns you. Well, you know what this will do? This will allow you to seek His face unhindered. If you're continually worried about... Uh, what's going on, and if you're fearful in your everyday life, then I can promise you right now, seeking His face is not what we do. Well, the last thing I want to share before I jump into the, what we're going to be sharing today, the Scriptures, and I wrote beside this, this is for me. Now, I'm going to share something that's for me, and hopefully it will benefit you too, and this is for me. Sit quietly in His presence, allowing His light to soak into you and drive out any darkness uh, lodged within you. Do you know that that's one of the hardest things we as people, I, I said Americans, but it may be Norwegians or Romanians or Mexicans or people in Peru, Peruvians or Argentines, you name it, wherever you are, sitting quietly is something that's very, very, very difficult to do because we're just not, we're not bent that way. We want to be doing something. We want to be thinking something. And yet I have noticed that the Spirit, when I hear from the Spirit on the inside, generally it's when I'm doing, quote unquote, nothing. Now, I don't know how it is in your country. I, I've been in a lot of countries. But in America, we have to be doing something. I had a boss. He's a good guy. And he was, a, he was of the greatest generation. He was... Uh, he was a tank commander in World War II, and he fought in a lot of battles until he was 
injured and had part of his foot blown off by a mine and uh, he had to come home. But good guy, good guy. I enjoyed working for him. He had, he had so many stories. Good guy. And he used to say, we'd come in and we'd be doing something. He said, uh, he used to say, let's do something while you're wrestling. Just do something. And I was a salesman in a furniture store. In fact, I was young and I was the number one salesman in the store. He had two stores. And, uh, but he was kind of joking. He said, just do something. Look busy. And I'm afraid that's the way that a lot of us think. Do something even if it's wrong. And you know how foolish that is. Because if you do something that's wrong, what do you have to do then? You have to go back and fix it. DJ, you write code, whatever that means. My son-in-law writes codes, my son. You know, I put your picture along with the other pictures on, of the other boys. On, and uh, somebody said, Craig, how, uh, uh, can you tell me their names? How many sons do you have for? What are their names? And one of them was freaking out. Finally, somebody said, DJ's Lars' husband. I never put that. They did. But anyway, my son, DJ, he, uh, he writes code, whatever that is. And, and, uh, and he does it very well. And, and, the, and they, they get paid pretty good. I'm glad. Praise the Lord. I'm glad you do. I'm glad they're nerds. I mean, people like you that. <laughs> <laughs> DJ is what we call a nerd athlete. <clears throat> Laura met him at a Bible study, and uh, he's a big old boy, and he's a big old boy. I'm glad that he's a good guy, because I'd have to get help. You know, if I had to go after DJ, I'm pretty sure I wouldn't be going after that on my own. But uh, DJ is a really good athlete, but he's a nerd. And let me tell you something, the world's going to be ruled by nerds, I can tell you right now. DJ's laughing because he knows it's true. But, uh, but anyway, praise the Lord for nerds, pays the bills. Today, we're going to be in Romans chapter 8. We're going to listen to the Spirit. We're going to listen to the Spirit and what the Spirit is telling us. And I'm going to tell you what the Spirit is telling you. Now listen, the Spirit is telling you, ready, that you're a child of God. You say, not everybody. Well, I have a question. Who are you going to believe? Are you going to believe what the Spirit is telling you? You say, well, yeah, but people can be misinformed. They can be, they can be confused. Okay. Will you believe what the Scriptures tell you about you being a child of God? Paul was speaking to the folks at Mars Hill over in Macedonia or in present-day Greece, Athens, and he was talking to them and he was telling them about this unknown God. They worship an unknown God. And Paul said, oh, I see you worship an unknown God. Let me tell you about the unknown God who is, the, in fact, the true God, what he says. But in verse 28 and 29, while he's talking about this unknown God, who we know as Yahweh, who we know as the great I Am, who Jesus claimed to be, he said before Abraham was born, I Am. This is what he said. In Acts chapter 17, verse 28, for in Him, Yahweh, Jesus, in Him we live and move and exist. All is in Him. As even some of your own poets have said, listen to what Paul's saying now, for we also are His children. Now, who's he talking to? He's talking to people that have not believed yet. Now, many of them did. But at this point, none of them had. And he says, we are his children. Now, do they know it? No. Do they act like it? No. It's kind of like the prodigal son, quote unquote. He wasn't living like a son, but he was. Well, in verse 29, Acts 17, 29, being then the children of God, Paul's built his case. Being then the children of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and thought of man. He said it's, this relationship is not based on what we do. You know, you make, you make an idol or whatever it is. And you know, your idol doesn't have to be something made out of physical material. An idol can be a child. It can be a position. Your idol can be religion. Now, this is going to sound strange. Your idol actually could be the scripture. Now, is there anything wrong with the scripture? Of course not. Do I believe the Bible? Yes. 
But I'm telling you right now, Jesus is the Word. It's amazing. See, I read the Bible long before I ever knew Jesus. Long before I ever knew who I was. Long before I ever believed Him. But when I did, as I began to understand who I was in Christ, and I'm talking about many, many years ago, I was a 22-year-old guy. I wasn't seeking anything. I wasn't looking for anything. And I remember one night, God literally... <laughs> found me laying in my bed at night and began to deal with my heart when I was doing nothing. But the next day, as I began to read in the scriptures, I began to understand things. I would read it and I would say, well, yeah, that makes perfect sense. Didn't have a religious bone in my body. Had to learn that. Well, that's who we were. You see, in verse chapter 8, verse 16 in the book of Romans, it says, the Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. That's exactly what happened to me. The Spirit of God bears witness with our spirit. I could say, let's own it, my spirit. The Spirit of God was speaking to my spirit and telling me, you are a child of God. And you know what? I believed Him. You say, had you prayed the prayer? Hadn't prayed anything. Didn't know anything. Did I pray? I did. But not so it would be. I didn't understand what was going on. Didn't have anybody leading me. I was by myself. <sighs> My life was changed. October 24th, your birthday, or Johnny's birthday, 1972. I almost said 1922. It's 71, excuse me. Thank you. October 24th, <laughs> 1970. Never will forget. What a great day. But uh, that we are... Children of God. Well, let's look at this. The Spirit. And it says here, the Spirit Himself. Now, there is, it could be herself, it could be itself. And in the Old Testament, the Bible, refer, the word Spirit in the Old Testament, you know it's a feminine word. Now, you see, because the Spirit is not a, not a being in the sense like a body. The Spirit is not masculine, feminine. I, I think God has kind of a sense of humor. That uh, when he said the spirit herself, which is what it says in the Old Testament. I think he did that just so you'd know that it was all about him. And it was, anyway, the spirit. And then he goes on to say in the word atu is the word there. And it says the spirit himself. You see in the, in the, in the Spanish and in the Italian and in the French and, and many other languages and Portuguese, you don't need to add a pronoun or a noun to make it a complete sentence because the verb has its own. Well, in this case, when they add the pronoun, it's, it would be read like this, the Spirit. That's right, none other than the Spirit. He adds this to make a point right here. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit. And this word Spirit, you know what this, what this word means? This is kind of cool. It means a baffling wind. A baffling wind. You know, it's something that, that you can't see. You can't smell. You don't smell wind. Now you can smell what the wind brings. But a baffling wind bears witness with our spirit. This word bears witness. This means to bear joint witness with. This means to testify. The spirit, that's right. None other than the one who was involved in creation has chosen to tell me the truth about my true identity. With our spirit, who we are, that we are. We're talking about present and we're talking about an ongoing thing. And, and this word bear witness, this is a present tense again. He's continually doing this. It's not just a one-time thing. He's continually telling us that we are children. We're going to see what all goes with that. Children. This is our present continuous identity. Now, all people don't know this. And certainly all people don't believe this. But is it true whether they believe it or not? It is. Well, in verse 17, he goes on to talk about some of these things. You know, with my grandchildren here, they have, uh, now my grandchildren have the last name Decker. That's their daddy's name, and it's a great name. And he's a great man. But they have his name, and they have my, there's some of them that are actually kind of like me, which is terrifying. 
to some degree. But, you know, as an heir, all that their daddy owns, they own. He's not going to give it to them one day. He's not going to leave it to them one day. It's already theirs because they're part of the family. And it's the same with us. And if children, and this, a better class, a better way to, to uh, translate this, this class of conditional, you've heard me say this before, and since children, since we're children, heirs also. Also, that means along with. In the Spanish, I like the Spanish word for this, tambien. That means, yep, that's me too. I agree. It's true. What's true for you is true for me. God the Son is an heir. So are you. Now this is going to freak you out. We're going to see this. God the Son, this gives me chill bumps. God the Son, Jesus the Christ, is no more heir of the Father than you are. You think about that. All that has been given to the Son, the Son, has also been given to you. Heirs also. Heirs of God. He, he explains it three ways. Heirs also. Heirs of God. That's the Father. Fellow heirs with Christ. Isn't that great? He's saying it over and over. We're going to talk about these things. If indeed, or Again, since, indeed, we suffer with, and it's got him in the English, but it's not in the original. Since we suffer with, in order that we may also be glorified with, and it adds him. Now, folks, this is huge. Since we are children, and we are. He's stating a fact. He's building a case. Since we are children, and we are. Because we're children... That makes us heirs. Now this word heir, it, uh, it comes from a word that means to distribute. One receives a lot. Now it doesn't mean one receives a lot. It means one receives a lot. You know, I've heard y'all talk about your children. You got two children and you got a bunch of grandchildren and some great grandchildren. And you know, one's getting the lake house and one's getting this and you kind of divide things up. They're getting a lot. But in truth, there's an agreement made there. But the bottom line is, what's y'all's, theirs. I'm going to make, I'm not, I almost said something. I was going to say, I'm going to make fun of, but no, I'm not. I'm going to talk about my dear brother, Johnny Wynn, one of my favorite people in the whole world. Johnny Wynn is a collector. Accumulator. Accumulator. <laughs> he has built some houses to store his accumulation. <laughs> And I tease him all the time. I said, one day your children are going to be mighty mad at you. <laughs> they got to do, and it's all good stuff, isn't it, Johnny? Oh, yeah. It's good stuff. But the bottom line, it's already theirs. It's already theirs. And, and, <laughs> Sue <laughs> Wynn. <laughs> yeah, right. Sue Wynn said they could take some of it home with them now. But, but anyway, one day they'll have to do something with it. We don't know when that day is. But the bottom line is they're your heirs. My children are my heirs. Your children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren are your heirs. That means they're family. You know, this is kind of funny. In the strictest sense of the word, you don't give an heir anything. An heir is based on identity and not on action. Do you know if somebody dies without a will, do you know what happens? The heirs get it. Whatever's left. That's the law. Why? Because they're family. And that's the way it is with you. You're family. This word heir, again, it means to distribute. It means receive the allotted possession because of sonship. That's what the word means. We're not even talking about a biblical definition. I'm just giving you this word. To receive the allotted possession because of sonship. You see, all that you've been given is because of who you are. And He's not going to give you anything one day. We have this idea, one day it's going to be glory and by and by. No. It is now. This is who we are. And since we're heirs, then this is the way it is. 
And it says this word fellow heirs, fellow heirs. This means fellow heirs with Christ, joint or equal. One who obtains something assigned to him. Equal. Now this seems, this is, un, this, this is beyond what I could ever think or even hope. That all that belongs to Christ is equally mine. You know, and it starts with his position. The Bible says that we're seated with Christ in the English, and it could be translated, and I like this better, in Christ on his throne. His position is our position. Now, this doesn't mean that we're God, because we're not. But in the glorified man, Christ Jesus, we are in him, and his position has been given to us. We are in him. Now, some, some of your, your mind might be running. I know mine does sometimes. Well, yes, but that's for people that have prayed. Hmm. You won't find that in the scriptures. That's for people who have believed. They need to believe it, to benefit from it. But it's true. What do they believe? See, here's what we've done. Here's what evangelical Christianity has done. They have said the believing comes first, and then that changes the outcome. You believe, God's going to love you, bring you into his kingdom. You don't believe, God's going to cast you out. Folks, if this were the case, you're already out. And that's where people already are. They don't know who they are. They don't know what's been given. It's amazing. Which comes first, the belief or the prayer? Which comes first? In evangelical Christianity. You see, I believe God shows you some things. Is there anything wrong with praying? No. Is there anything wrong with believing? No. You must believe. Is there anything wrong with receiving? No. We receive what He has already given. We believe what He has already done from eternity past. We believe who He says we are. It's so exciting. It says, since we suffer with. This word suffer with. This again is present tense, continuous action. This word suffer. It means feel pain together. And we're not just talking about the pain of the cross. I don't think you could ever feel that in the sense that Jesus did. Because you see, he did something you could never do. He who knew no sin became sin. So that we might become the righteousness of God in him. But let me tell you what we can do. When Jesus, it says in... When Jesus saw the multitudes, the Bible says that he felt compassion. Let me tell you what that word means. It literally means he was sick to his bowels. When he saw the state cast down like sheep without a shepherd, the Bible says that it made him sick. But see, more than just making him sick, there was a desire to do something about it. And his desire was that he would become sin and they would become righteous. You see, when you see people that don't know Christ, that don't know who they are, that don't know what God has done and have not believed it, how do you feel about them? Do you get mad at things they do? Sometimes I do. Do you think one day, <laughs> I've heard this, yeah, one day, God's keeping track. The great scorekeeper in the sky, he's keeping up. And one day they're going to get what they deserve. Yeah. Yeah. Tragically, that's how a lot of people think. I've thought that way. But that's not the way God thinks. Aren't you glad? Because that would be you. Man, since we're glorified with Christ, I'm sorry, since we are uh, suffer with Christ, in order that we may also be glorified with Christ, and you could say in Christ, glorified Mm. You know what this means? This means to approve together. Do you know the glory of God? I used to say God will not. I, no, you have to say it like this. God won't share his glory with anyone. Except that's not what the Bible teaches. In Colossians 3, 4. Read that verse. But it says here that we're going to be glorified. And this is, this is uh, error subjunctive passive. Let me tell you what that means. Eris, completed action. Now you say, when did this take place? When you die? No. 
It took place at the cross. Now understand this. The cross took place at a point in time, but the cross is eternal. So this was this had already happened before God created anything because before the foundation of the world, He chose you. He's already declared you a son in love, predestined you to sonship. And if a son, heir. So you were an already you were already were an heir of all that there is before He created anything. Isn't this big? Passive voice. Let me tell you what that means. That means someone else caused the action. You had nothing to do with it. He has chosen, God the Father has chosen to glorify you along with God the Son. Let me say it another way. God the Father has chosen to approve of you exactly like He approves of the Son. Now folks, if that doesn't if that doesn't do it for you, you just don't understand. And then he says in verse 18, For I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed in us. This word consider, uh, it means to uh, put in all the variables and obtain an answer. In other words, Compute. DJ understands computing. You know, computers, you say, well, they're complicated. No, they're not. Writing all that stuff. You only got to remember two things, zero and one. That's it. Two numbers. Anybody could do that. Isn't that right? <laughs> hey, that's right. You know, it's, it's the law of probability. If you do this, then this happens. Zeros and ones. That's what it is. Binary. Well, with computing, it says here, we've considered it. We've computed all the facts, and this outcome comes out. And here it is. Sufferings not to be even compared to the glory revealed. In our country, in the U.S., and I don't know how it is in some of your countries. Some of them I do. And, and the Western countries in Europe, now they've been through stuff. There's no question about it. But in the Western world... We don't understand a lot. That's why Western theology is sometimes such a mess. If you want to go close to the time of Christ, you go back to Eastern theology. And in Eastern theology, it was different. In Eastern theology, today the closest thing to it would be Eastern Orthodox. They would say that it was finished basically before it was started. And they would say you need to believe what is and what always has been so you can understand the benefit of it. In Western theology, we say, do your part, and then he'll do something for you. But I'm telling you, the Eastern was first. It's not worthy to be compared when you compare suffering with glory. Some of the countries I've been to, I think about some of the Christians in Haiti. When I first went down there, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. A Christian father, his goal for the day, a Christian father now, was to feed his family something. One out of two children died before they were five. Fifty percent of the children died before they were five years old. Primarily because of bad water. One of my friends has a ministry, a big one. It's called Water for Life. A dear, dear friend. And the ministry is quite large. And, and God has shown what I'm talking about here uh, to them. And it's exciting what they're doing. And, and they're using water, physical water, to share living water. But these people suffer. I remember I was in an orphanage. First time I went to Haiti, and I've been there so many times, I, I, I really don't remember. But I, I remember being in an orphanage, and it was, folks, make, you, make your heart, just break your heart. And a, and a little boy was holding a bird with a head already gone. A little boy. And he'd caught the bird, and, you know, and things they'll eat just because there is no food. I can remember one time some kids, we were eating breakfast. We'd cooked at our compound and some kids came and, and all we had left was cold grits. And you know, grits, I, for those of you in the north or, or maybe in another country, you don't even know what grits are. Some people said they're hominy grits. Oh man, how do I say this in a sweet way? Those people live above, above the north of the Mason-Dixon line if they call them hominy grits. 
Hominy's corn, grits come from corn. Uh, grits are grit, folks. It's not corn. But when they're warm and a little butter on them, salt and pepper, they're really good. But when they're cold, and when you can cut grits, not that good. And I can remember some of those kids outside, they got the grits, and it was like a block of grits. And here's what they did. That was the first bite, and then they ate the rest of it. Because they were hungry. And folks, I'm afraid that many of us don't understand sufferings, but I'm telling you this, what those people did understand, one of my, one of my dear brothers, his name was Pastor Tony Paul, and he had about 25 churches under him. And Pastor Tony, he said, we die so easily, and they don't have doctors. And so when they're sick, they pray. When they have needs, they pray. I remember we were stuck down there and the hurricane was coming and they couldn't get a plane in to get us out and we had to stay. I was really concerned about the shacks and the shanties where they, were, where they lived. And, and Pastor Tony, he said this, and he was so unconcerned. And I said, Pastor Tony, do you understand? This big hurricane, hurricane coming. He says, oh, brother. He said, God knows our situation. He said, God will protect us. And you know, he did. And he always has. I'm not saying it couldn't hit Haiti, but I'm saying that part of that island has been spared so many times. Some people say it's because of the mountain range that's there between Dominican Republic and between Haiti and the way the winds come. I think it's God. I've known people. There was this one guy, and, uh, and I'm going to be through in just a moment, but there was this one guy. He was, uh, he was a man that had, he was quite wealthy, and he devoted a big portion of his fortune to, to minister in Haiti. And I met him, and we were building as we were going to build some a school, high school. And Pastor Tony said, "I want you to bring it." And we had people in our church that were contractors, and I brought. We took two DC threes, one filled with people, twenty-four people, and one filled with supplies, and we flew to Haiti. But before that happened, I get a phone call from this guy, and he said, uh, "Are you Craig Snyder?" I said, "Yes, sir." And I was a young guy then. And he said, "My name is so and so," and he said, "I'm a farmer." <laughs> He was a farmer. And uh, he said, I hear you're going to be building. Where do you hear you're going to Haiti? I said, yes, sir, I am. He said, what are you going to be doing? I said, well, we're going to be building a high school. And then we'll be preaching at night. He says, uh, who are you taking with you? And I told him. And then he said this. He said, who's paying for it? I said, I don't know. Pastor Tony told me not to worry about it. God would provide so I could just sense him shaking his head. He said, okay, I think he's talking about me. And he gave me $30,000. Never laid eyes on the man for several years later. Gave us $30,000. And that paid for the initial part of the contracting that we did to buy supplies, you know, concrete, steel, things like that. Anyway, this man was diagnosed with terminal prostate cancer. So I heard about it. So I called him one day. I said, dear brother. Here you're sick. He said, what are you talking about? I said, I hear you're sick. He said, what? I said, you're cancer. He goes, oh, that. I said, yeah, that. Well, he didn't say much about it, but he rocked on. And, and the doctor said, you know, you don't have much time left. And he said, I want to go to Haiti again. And he said, well, go. Go now. And so he goes down to Haiti. And, and uh, every Saturday morning, you've been to it, they had a group of Haitian pastors and men that would meet, and about 1,500 of them meet every Friday, every Saturday. And, uh, and so Pastor Tony told him, he says, come on, we're going to the, to the prayer meeting. And Pastor Tony said, you're not going to die from this. And uh, he said, we're going to pray for you. Now, you can tell anybody that if God tells you that and you know it. But, you know, people die, they do. But in this case, Pastor Tony had, a, for lack of a better word, a word from the Lord. So he goes there and they pray for him. And then he said, now you go home and show the doctors. So he flew back to the States and went back to the doctors. And guess what? No cancer. Now you say, that couldn't happen. Well, you believe what you will. It did. Well, later on, years later, he did die, but not from that. So what I'm saying is the sufferings of this time. You know, when you're in a situation where you're not in control, you know what that does? And I'm talking just like I know what I'm talking about. It forces you to trust God. 
You've been in a situation like that where you had to trust God. You, there's nothing else you could do. And you find out that's a very safe place to be. In, in Pakistan, where, where y'all are, I, I think about the things that, that the Christian goes through in Pakistan. And things that we don't have. Now, it could come here. Believe me, it could come here. But things that you deal with that we don't deal with. But here's what I know. God is bigger than the situation. And God is in control. Even when people don't understand what's going on, God is still in control. And you can know that God is bigger than the government. And God is bigger than disease. And God is bigger than what people think of you. And this is something that's even stranger than that. God is bigger than what you think of you. Consider the sufferings of this present time not worthy to be compared with the glory that is going to be revealed. Now to many, those in Haiti, those in Pakistan, those around the world, this is a way of life. They have counted the cost. The life of the flesh, sometimes we think if our flesh is satisfied, if we're healthy, if we have all our needs met financially, if we've got a nice place to sleep. I, I've said before, you know, if I've got, I think I'm being spiritual when I say it. If I've got a good mattress and an air conditioner, God is good. I'm okay. But folks, I've been places where they didn't have a good mattress and there wasn't an air conditioner and there were hundreds of thousands of mosquitoes. We would kill mosquitoes at night and I think, well, that's terrible, but soon I'll be home. Other people live with that all the time. It's a way of life. Count the cost. The life of the flesh is temporary, but eternity in Him is real. In verse 19. I think this will be our last verse for today. For the anxious longing of creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. Now, you've read this verse, and usually we just gloss over it. Now, look at this. For the anxious longing... Anxious longing. Earnest longing. I mean, this is the deep down de desire inside of you. The deep down desire of creation. When we think of creation, what are we talking about? We're talking about the universe. You know, most of what we think the universe is, is just a small portion. There's a thing called dark matter, which is so much, almost the whole universe is composed of dark matter and we can't see it. It's something we don't really understand. The little part that we can see is minuscule, minuscule compared to what is. But all of what is, all of what's created longs for the day. Now, this is amazing. Of the revealing of the sons of God. All of God's creation waits. And this it says eagerly. But let me tell you what that means. This is a present tense, continuous action. It's ongoing. Waits because and it's a middle or passive voice. Let me tell you what that means. That means they're doing it because they want to. Because it's their desire. Because they want to, it's their desire. The desire of all creation. And it could be a passive voice. Something's causing it. The impending revelation of... Not of God, but of the sons of God is causing them to earnestly long for, patiently waiting, expectation of God revealing not just His sons, but their identity, how He feels about them. It says the revealing, and this word revealing, it means laying bare. It means making naked. It means disclosure of truth of the sons of God. We would say it another way. Can't wait for the revealing of God's children in their glory given to them by God. You know, the angels are part of creation. They're created beings. And the position of the angels is ministering servant, or servants or are ministering servants for you. We have the, I hear people say sometimes, so-and-so he died, he received, he received his angel wings. And I know they mean well, but folks, that could not be further from the truth. They didn't receive any wings. They don't need them. 
They have glorified bodies exactly like the bodies of Christ. They're in Christ and the angels are in awe of the children of God. They're in awe of them. And they think one day we'll get to see them. And I don't understand all that because you see in eternity it's already finished. But this word creation, in another place it says there's this longing. And we're going to see later on, it's like a, like a mother giving birth. There are child pains. And, and there's this, this agonizing child pain that leads to great glory when the baby's born. And that's what's going on right here. I'm going to read the verse and we'll pick it up for the same verse next week. We're going to stop here. For the creation was subjected to futility. Not of its own will, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Now, him who subjected it. Now, this is something that's really strange. At one time, I would have said, yep, that's Satan. But it's not. That's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. It was subjected to futility. Because he loves you. And I don't understand all this. I'll be praying about this verse this week. But folks, God is in control. He's got it worked out. And if you don't hear anything today, what I've told you, except for this one thing, you are a child of God. And the Spirit is telling you on the inside. If you've never believed, say, are you talking to me? And say, reveal your truth to me about my true identity. I have a friend, he's over, uh, he's, he's a, he would tell you if he were here, his name is Mike Quarles. If you would Google Mike Quarles' name, you'd see he's written, he's written some great books on the subject of abuse. Abuse with alcohol or drugs or whatever. Addiction. And Mike says, the way you come out of that, and I'm summarizing, and Mike, I hope I'm doing you justice, Mike Quarles, get his books. And he says that the way you come out of this addiction is not by saying, hello, my name is so-and-so, and I am, and you're saying, I am an alcoholic, or I am a drug addict, or, and you're going through life with that being your identity, and there's no hope for me, so I need you. But he says that he's wrong. Hello, my name is Craig Snyder, and I am a child of God. And the glory of God has been given to me. And the angels in heaven along with all creation are eagerly awaiting my revelation as to my true nature in Christ. When you begin to believe that, you're going to find out things change. And we've gone about it wrong. We've attacked the problem that we think is the problem. And the problem that we've attacked is only the symptom. And the problem is that they don't know their true identity. So here's your identity. You are a child of God. You are gloriously made. The Spirit is bearing witness to you. Last week we saw that the Spirit causes me to cry, Abba, Father, Daddy. Well, we'll pick it up next week in verse 20. Love you guys and I hope this was a benefit. And we will see you next time.